Today, let's start talking about waves and vibrations. To start off, let's review sound waves for a little bit. Sound waves are a mechanical wave, and they're also longitudinal, which means they vibrate in along the same direction that the wave travels. And sound waves have two major parts, compressions and rarefactions. If you measure the distance between one compression and the next compression, that will be the wavelength of that sound wave. Now, since sound waves are a mechanical wave, they need a medium to travel through, like air or water or a solid. So they can't travel in a vacuum. Uh, there's an old movie called Aliens that I remember on the advertisement, it always said, in space, nobody can hear you scream, which is true because there's no air in space. There's no medium for that sound to travel through. And so you couldn't be heard. Uh, now, because waves or sound waves are mechanical waves, their speed depends on the medium they're traveling through. So a sound wave will travel the fastest in a solid, then next slower in water or a fluid, and then actually the slowest in air. But there's a catch to the, the air one that we need to talk about. Now, since sound is a wave, it's follow, it follows the wave equation. Velocity equals wavelength times frequency. But as far as air is concerned, the temperature of air will affect how fast sound travels in that air. The warmer the air, the faster the molecules of air are moving around, so the faster the sound can propagate through that medium. So for us, we're going to use that the speed of sound is 330 meters per second plus an additional 0.6 for every degree Celsius. And so the warmer the air, the faster sound will travel, the cooler the air, the slower sound will travel. So let's look at a, a problem with one of these. So let's say we've got a sound wave, has a frequency of 256 in our two, uh, 23 degrees Celsius room, and I want to find its period and wavelengths. Well, first of all, since I know the frequency, I want to find the period first because remember, period and frequency are inverses of each other. So if you know one, you take the inverse, you've got the other one. So if I take the inverse of 256, in other words, one divided by 256, I get the period of 0 0.0039 seconds. That means it takes 0 0.0039 seconds for one wave to pass. Now that I've got that, I want to go ahead and figure out the speed of sound in air at that temperature. Well, I know the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, or 23 degrees Celsius. And so I'll multiply that by 0.6 and add 330 to it. And so I get the velocity of sound at that temperature to be 343.8 meters per second. Now that I know the velocity, I can use the wave equation because I know velocity and frequency. Velocity is 343.8. Frequency is 256. Divide, and I get a wavelength of 1.34 meters. We try another one. This time, I give you the wavelength of 1.5 meters at now a 25 degrees Celsius room. Again, since I know the temperature, I want to figure out the speed of sound at that temperature first. So 330 plus 0.6 times 25. I get the speed of sound at that room temperature of 345 meters per second. Using the wave equation again, 345 equals the wavelength, which is 1.5 times frequency. I'm going to divide and I get a frequency of 230 hertz. Now this one is a little bit more unique problem. This is one where I'm not worrying about wavelength or frequency or period or anything like that. I actually want to find a distance, or in some cases, I may want to find a time, how long it takes for this to happen. So let's say I've got a ship on the water, and the speed of sound in water is 1,400 meters per second. And that ship sends out a pulse of sound in the water that goes out, bounces off an object, and comes back in four seconds. So in my picture, the little blue object represents the boat, and the red object represents, well, the object. And those little slash lines represents the sound, the blue's going from the ship to the object, 
and the red's coming from the object back up to the ship. So it takes four seconds to make that round trip. Well, if it takes four seconds to make that round trip, then the time it takes to go from the boat to the object is only two seconds. And since I just want the distance to the object, that's the time that I'm gonna, need, gonna use. The other thing is, we're gonna go back to an old equation for velocity. Velocity is equal to distance divided by time. And so in this case, my velocity is 1,400. Distance I don't know, but times two seconds. Cross multiply, and I got that the object is 2,800 meters away from the boat. Now we can do the same thing if I give you the distance. Let's say that I give you a problem where the distance between a person and a cliff is 400 meters. And that person yells, and we wanna know the time it takes for that echo to get back to him. Well, that sound had to go 400 meters to the wall and then 400 meters back. So the total distance would be 800 meters then. So if I know the velocity and that distance of 800 meters, I can solve for time and figure out how long it took for that person to hear the echo of their voice bouncing off that cliff wall. Now for some definitions. I'll start off with natural frequency. Natural frequency is simply the sound that an object makes whenever it's struck. So some things are designed to play specific frequencies, specific notes, like a xylophone or a tuning fork or something like that. And those objects are, are cut from particular materials that are certain thickness or certain length, shape, to always give that same note. Even how they're fastened onto an object will make a difference. So you think about a xylophone. The really small bars play the high frequencies. The long bars play the low frequencies. And they're all pretty much uniform thickness and width. So it would be the length that changes the frequency. So the longer the bar, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So that's why the long bars play the low notes, and the small bars play the high notes. A sympathetic vibration, that's when you make an object play its natural frequency by actually playing that frequency in the object, kind of vibrating along with it because it wants to vibrate at that frequency. So, the two objects don't need a touch. So what you can do if, let's say I have a tuning fork that its natural frequency is 256 hertz. For sympathetic vibration, I simply need to use a speaker or another tuning fork that plays that same frequency, 256 hertz. Those waves go out to the receiving tuning fork and that receiving tuning fork wants to vibrate at that frequency. So as soon as those waves hits, since that's its natural frequency, it'll automatically pick up that vibration and start playing that same frequency, 256. So if we cut off the original source, that object that, let's say, again, tuning fork, will still be vibrating because that's the frequency it wants to vibrate. It naturally does that. And so it will continue to play even though we cut off the original source of the, of the wave. Uh, another example of this is... Uh, if you have a car that's got a really bad rattle at a certain speed, below that speed it's gone, above that speed it's gone, but at a certain speed you get a very bad rattle. That's because the frequency of maybe the tires rotating or something matches the natural frequency of whatever's rattling in the dash. And so whenever you're on that frequency, it automatically sends that vibration through the entire car, but that one thing that's in your dash that's rattling, that's also its natural frequency, so it starts moving automatically. And to get, to stop it, you simply have to get off that speed, get off that frequency, and it'll go away. Sympathetic vibrations only work for matching frequencies. So a 256 tuning fork will only play when 256 hertz sound wave strikes it. That would be a sympathetic vibration where you get the best results. 
A forced vibration is when you make something vibrate a frequency it doesn't want to. In other words, not its natural frequency. And so if I was to take a tuning fork and strike it and touch it against uh, a piece of wood or something like that, I can cause that whole piece of wood to vibrate at the same frequency as the tuning fork, even though that piece of wood does not want to vibrate at that frequency. The physical contact between the tuning fork and the board will cause that board to vibrate at that same frequency. Now we use this a lot, especially with music, because instruments like a guitar or a violin or something, they have a wood bass that picks up the vibrations of the string, and since that wood bass is a lot larger, takes, uh, has more surface area than that string, it can move more air, so it will amplify the sound. Uh, a good example is if you ever had somebody play an electric guitar without it being plugged in. The electric guitar is designed for the pickups to pick up the vibrations, send them to a speaker. So when that's not there, it's just the strings. And the bass of those guitars are not designed to pick up the frequency of the strings and amplify it. And so it's very dull and, and bland and not very good. But an acoustic guitar, that bass is designed to pick up the vibrations of that string so the whole bass vibrates. That way, that way it vibrates the air around it. And since it's moving more air, it makes the sound louder. Now, a resonance, a resonance is sort of like a sympathetic vibration, except it's amplified. Normally, a sympathetic vibration, every time that wave's passed, the amplitude gets less and less and less, eventually diminish. But with resonance, you're playing something's natural frequency, and the situation amplifies that vibration in the object. And so it will seem louder. Okay? Not diminish, it actually seems like it builds. Uh, one of the best examples I have here is when like an opera singer or a, a singer can hit and hold a note that matches the natural frequency of a wine glass. That wine glass will start vibrating. And if they can hold that note and get that to resonate, the glass will vibrate more and more and more until eventually it could break. Now, resonance doesn't mean that things automatically break. Sometimes they just simply get louder or they're just amplified. But in that dramatic demonstration, the, actual, the wine glass actually shatters even though nobody's touching it because of that sound matching its natural frequency and adding energy to that glass. And there's plenty of videos out there that you can see from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to uh, breaking wine glasses using sound that you can search to see this effect going on. All right. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.